In this video, we are going to learn to solve the Laplace equation on a disk. You all may remember that the Laplace equation corresponds to the equilibrium solution to the heat equation. So, if I were interested in solving the heat equation on this disk with certain boundary conditions, and let's put some in here, so let's assume that uh, we have a disk of radius A and that I tell you that the boundary of that disk is going to be fixed at some temperature f of theta. So theta just parameterizes the boundary of the disk. Okay, so I fix the temperature. I have start out with some initial condition and then I just let the heat equation evolve and over time the temperature distribution is going to move around a little bit and then it's going to stay, it's going to settle down to some equilibrium temperature. That equilibrium temperature is the solution to the Laplace equation on the disk. Now I just want to uh, make sure that everyone is clear that this is not baking a cookie. So baking a cookie is a three-dimensional problem and there are boundary conditions all over the surface of the cookie including this part here. Right? It's a three-dimensional flattened object. This is a 2D problem so really the analogy would be that everything here is insulated okay, and you just have energy entering and leaving through the boundary. Uh, but inside, it's just, uh, it's just diffusing. Sorry, my pen got a little wild there. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and write down how this is going to work. Um, so the Laplacian in polar coordinates is different from rectangular coordinates. If you think you remember what the Laplacian is, now would be a good time to pause the video and see if you recall it correctly. That's going to be an important thing to know as we move forward in this class. Okay, but I'll write it down for you just in case you forgot. Okay, so hopefully you remembered correctly. 1 over r, r, du dr, and then the little sub r outside the parentheses means we take another partial with respect to r. Plus, 1 over r squared u theta theta. Okay? That funny little bit with r, that kind of rolls off the tongue. 1 over r, r u dr dr. Right? Uh, anyway, okay, and of course that whole thing is equal to 0. Very good. Now we separate variables in the hopes that something will uh, pop out of here and we'll be able to solve it. So let's give it a shot. So we're going to assume that u of r and theta can be written as a product that's g of r, all right, g of r, phi of theta. And now why did I pick g of r and phi of theta? Well, phi is typically our boundary value problem. Think about it, right? If I'm expressing a solution to this problem, all right, let me fix that again. If I'm expressing a solution to this problem, um, remember that phi was something we always had boundary conditions for. Well, phi, okay, is parameterized in theta is naturally periodic, right? So the solution, if I go, if I look at the solution and I go from zero, uh, if I go, uh, depending on how you parameterize theta, if you go from zero all the way around to two pi and back again, or from, from pi to minus pi, however you do it, the solution you get should be periodic in the theta direction. So that's why we put, um, we put phi of theta in there. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, because it's going to have naturally periodic boundary conditions. Uh, G of R, remember, will have boundary conditions at R, at, uh, R equals A. Okay. So that's just looking ahead. Um, so we go ahead and we, we plug that in and then we divide by U, just like usual. So I end up with, um, with 1 over G times 1 over r, r, g prime, prime. Now remember, mathematics isn't exactly poetry, so if you don't see how I got that by plugging g and phi in here and dividing by g phi, uh, then, uh, then go ahead and, and work this out on a piece of scratch paper right now. So the phi of theta actually came all the way out of all the derivatives because the derivatives are uh, the derivatives are r derivatives. These little prime represent r derivatives for this part. 
um, and uh, and so they don't um, uh, they don't depend upon theta. So phi can come out, but work it out on scratch paper. Give it a little thought about this. On the other side, I have a minus one over r squared. phi double prime over phi. Now we're in trouble already and we're just getting warmed up okay because these primes here mean an r derivative and these primes here mean a theta derivative. Remember that g and phi are, um, are functions of only one variable so the prime is the derivative in that variable. Um, typically when we separate variables we want all of one variable on one side and the other variable on the other side. Well, on this side, we have a function of both theta and r. But we can fix that pretty easily by moving the r squared to the other side. And that is precisely what we're going to do. So I'm going to multiply through by r squared. So now I get, I get 1 over g r r g prime prime equals phi double prime over phi with a minus sign, of course. Okay, now the only way, now th this side is a function of r only, and this is a function of theta only. So we are in good shape. Okay, now, uh, now that we have made our key assumption, um, we realize that, okay, the only way for this to happen is if they are constants. And you notice that I put lambda here. It's a positive lambda because there's a negative sign here. And we've seen this problem before. 